help me welcome to the pulpit tonight a big Jew and a great preacher, Dick Rubin. Give him the praise, amen. Just lift your hands and praise God and thank Jesus for what he's done this week in our life. Father, we thank you, Lord God, for what you've done. Thank you, Lord God, that what was once a drip only a few days ago now, Lord God, has become a river of living water. Oh, God, let this revival be poured out here, Father, for they've been faithful to you. Bless them and strengthen them, Lord God, is our cry. We ask it in the name that's above all names, Yeshua, our Messiah, Jesus, our Lord and Christ. Amen. Amen. God bless you. I want my wife to come up here. I've never done this before out of the years that we've been on the road and met so many people. But together I want to say thank you, both of us. To you as a congregation, to you as a hungry people, not everybody's hungry. Thank you for your hunger. Just thank you. I have nothing else to say except thank you for treating us so good and loving us and, and just being so good to us. Would you like to say something? Yes. <laughs> I could say it. <laughs> We do thank you for your love. I've had many come and say what we've given to you, but you've given to us. Yes. You'll never know. There's been a burning desire in my husband's heart for the last two years, as Brother Steve said, and it's been a vision that has been burning in his heart, and you've answered that. And I just thank you. I thank you for your love. I thank you for your kindness. And just as Pastor said, there's just no words to say. And I want you to know that your pastor has God's heart and his wife. I really do. And I want you all just to really appreciate him. I want you to call him. I want you to tell him how much you love him and appreciate him. Don't take him for granted. But they have God's heart. It's, I'm sad and I'm glad. I'm glad we've made newfound friends, but I'm sad to leave. <laughs> feel bond with y'all and just thank you well so now <laughs> I'm gonna preach <laughs> before we begin I want to share something with you and I want to I want to thank the television crew Steve Whitehead, I, I don't know that much about television, I don't, but all I can tell you is the end result is powerful. He's the man that sits back in the little room back there that no one ever sees. But I'm telling you, if you can ever get a video in your hands, you need last night's video. And the reason that I say that is that he sits behind there, and there are three cameras that are placed in different places of the sanctuary. And he sits there on a place that has three little, like, little television sets. They're called monitors. And he looks at that, and he decides which camera he wants to pull in to make a video. In other words, he gets this scene, and that camera's taking one shot, and this camera's taking another shot. He has to make that determination. Last night, you've got to get this in your mind, last night he has three men that he's talking to, and while he's talking to them, he's telling them where he wants them next, and all the time he's pulling the levers to make these things fit together. It's almost like you have 10 balls in the air all at once. And it can't keep his mind necessarily on the message. But last night he had to come out here because of the power of God that was here in this sanctuary. 
And I want to share something with you. We'll open up briefly in your Bible to Revelation. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 4. After this, this is John speaking. I looked and behold a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me which said, come up hither, and I believe this picture is the rapture of the church. And I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one that sat upon the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight likened unto an emerald now there's a phenomena that brother Steve told me about and it's called lens flare in other words when a lens is pointed sometimes to a bright object it will pick up the colors of the rainbow but something last night as we looked at this video today of course, Steve, being the technician that he is, says, well, that's a phenomenon of a characteristic of the televisions, the cameras. But some of the cameras need some work, like some tubes. And he said, because this one camera had a weakness, it did something phenomenal. And tonight, if I could have added something to what happened last night, I would have added the same thing that the weak camera did. And you'll look at it when you get this video. And as the, one of the cameramen was shooting to the ceiling to see the smoke rise, there appeared out of nowhere a brilliant red circle or a brilliant green circle outlined by a red border. It was right in the midst of that smoke that was coming up. I mean, you have to see it to believe it. Right away, I, I began, the tears began to come to my eyes. My wife began to cry. And I told Steve, I said, do you realize that that's what the Bible says that's around the throne where Jesus sits? And God says, I will enthrone myself upon the praises of my people. And as our praises were going up, I don't care what the phenomena was. All I can say is there's a brilliant emerald circle with a red border around it and I believe that God was in this place last night and Jesus was enthroned upon the praises of his people. You have to see it to believe it. And I would encourage you if at all possible, get at least that one tape. It will change your life. Now, I want to share one other thing before we get into tonight's message. In the Old Testament, the priest didn't have a set of safety matches that he struck and kindled the fire of the altar. God sent down his glory and consumed that first sacrifice upon the altar. But once the fire was kindled, then God made it the responsibility of the priest to keep the fire going. And if the fire went out, God says, I'm not sending any more fire. You're going to have to fan it to cause it to flame again. This week, there were many of you that came Sunday morning that were drips in the kingdom. But now, rivers of living water flowing you might not have the whole full river flowing yet but you got more flowing now than you had Sunday morning and when a pipe is unclogged it's unclogged and it begins to flow a little more and a little more and a little more and my challenge is to you that kingdom of priest don't let the fire go out that was kindled this week don't let it go out it's only begun to build into a flame. This is just the beginning of what God has called to Brownsville Assembly of God that I believe will spill over into many, many, many 
churches and denominations. There's going to be no more denominational barrier. Last night, there were so many good, wonderful reports this morning from last night's television show. I didn't see it. But they tell me that next week's is more powerful than what they saw last night. You've got a pastor that loves God. See, I was checking him out too this week. <laughs> Amen. When we get together, it's kind of like the beauty and the beast. <laughs> and you know who the beauty is and you know who the beast is. Amen. <laughs> but I personally thank Pastor Kilpatrick and his precious wife, Brenda. I personally thank you for what we thought was only going to be a couple of days. The pastor's done everything that he can to keep me through Sunday, but I can't. I can't because I had prior commitments. But there's some change on the horizon in our lives in the not too distant future that I sense in my spirit. And we'll be back. We'll be back. Check on that fire. I say this with all of my heart. What I think your pastor only thought would be a local television ministry. I believe tonight I'm speaking by the power of the Holy Ghost that this church will be known all across this country. All across this nation, they will see what's happening at Brownsville Assembly of God in Brownsville, Florida. But it's going to be up to you, priest, to keep that fire going. Amen. How many can say with an amen that you are flowing better in the things of God now than you were in the first part of the week? Say amen. God bless you. Now, let's get on with what we're doing this evening. Tonight's the last night. We're going to set the stage again in the tabernacle of Moses. That's where we've been. We've only scratched the service, surface, really, of what is contained within the tabernacle of Moses. If you can lower the house lights for just a moment. Again, we see that the focal point of the tabernacle itself was the sacrifice. This week, we've looked at the sacrifice of, of the trespass offering, how it applies to our life. All of the priests that you see within the confines of the tabernacle, they were all functioning. That's how all of us should function. We all don't have the same jobs. And let me tell you this. I don't know whether you've ever thought about this, but in this outer court, it was full of blood and guts. I hate to use that terminology and be blunt, but that's what it was. In the heat, as you begin to shed this blood, it begins to have a stench about it. Let me tell you, priest, something. It isn't always going to be clean work in the kingdom of God. If you're looking for king's houses, you're not looking for the kingdom of God. If you're looking to be a servant that is willing to put their hands to any and everything that needs to be done in the church, that's what servitude is. That's what the kingdom priesthood is all about. Now tonight, we're going to go back into that little area called the Mishkan, which is the building that was there in the tabernacle. I wanted to show this to you tonight because last night I was talking about the cherubim that are inwrought or embroidered on this particular veiling. And as the priest would walk into the first part of the door of the holy place, when he would look to the upper portion of that holy place, which was illumined by the oil of the lamps, which speaks of the Holy Spirit bringing revelation to the church age, he would notice God is always about him the angelic beings or ministering angels being set around him. And so the same with us. In the presence of God, God always has his ministering angels. Now we're going on to the inside of this little place called the Mishkan. Again, we're going to look at the picture that we looked at last night. Remember that the lampstand is on the south side. The um, a golden altar, which we spoke of last night, is up against the veil. That's why it's such a powerful understanding to understand what prayer, praise, and worship is in this hour, because the golden altar was the last piece of furniture that he passed before he went into the glory of God. 
Tonight we're going to be looking at the table of showbread. Now, we are in the process. We have a table of showbread about 70% finished. Hopefully next time we come back we'll have it because there's such a beautiful teaching on the table of showbread portion of it we're going to be giving to you tonight. But I want you to notice the table of showbread for just a moment. The table of showbread was really nothing but a golden table that had six rows, one, two, three, four, five, and six, six rows of bread on each table, I mean on each stack. Notice that there was a flagon of wine and there was also a cup. Now, we're going to see tonight that frankincense was put upon the bread, but I think it's been missed by most of the church. Most of us have been taught that the frankincense was ground to powder and put upon the bread. Uh, last night, if you, tonight we did take the incense off of the uh, altar here, but if you would have tasted some of the frankincense, you would find out very quickly that it will cause you to regurgitate. So the priest were to come to this table, they were to eat the bread once a week, and it couldn't have been incense upon the bread because they would not have been able to hold it down. It would have come up as fast as they ate it because it is bitter and it causes a violent reaction to your intestines. So really in the Hebrew, what we see then is when the, when the frankincense is put upon the bread, the portions of frankincense, that incense that we saw last night, frankincense was put upon these vessels. And as they would eat that bread, they would take that incense and where was the place to offer incense? Here at the golden altar. And they would burn that before the Lord. So now we have the table of showbread associated with prayer, praise and worship. Are you with me? Now tonight we're going to be looking at the significance of the table of showbread. What was its significance? It was there for the priest. We're going to find out about it tonight because it's going to reveal, I believe, a newfound depth of what the communion table is all about. And I think the church has really missed it because the enemy wants you to miss it because of the power that's in the table of the Lord. And that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. Every Jewish home on Friday night, interesting because it is Friday night tonight, we call it Erev Shabbat, the evening of Shabbat. And on every Jewish table or home, there is this setup that you see. Now when I say every Jewish home, I'm talking about the Jewish homes that celebrate Shabbat, those who are practicing their Judaism. You see, as we know by now, the patterns are set through the nation of Israel and they belong to the church. So every Friday night, the lady of the house comes and she is allowed to kindle the lights of Shabbat. My wife will do this tonight. I'd like to get a microphone because I'd like to have this for you. It's a prayer that is said. Now we as Messianic Jews, we pray a different prayer than the standard prayer of Judaism because we recognize this light as being Yeshua. And as the wife kindles the candles. I'm sorry that her back is to you, but I'll explain that in just a moment. Notice what she does. Blessed art thou, O Lord, our God, King of the world universe who has sanctified us by thy commandments and has given us Yeshua the Messiah and commanded us to be a light unto the world. Amen. That occurs in every home. That prayer is said in Jewish homes who have received the Messiah. The word for them, of course, they call us Messianic Jews because we believe in the Messiah. Now the woman is given a very special privilege. Part of her religious duties are to kindle the lights on Sabbath and Holy Days and at Passover. Why is the woman given this duty? Because it was the woman who put out the light of the world in the Garden of Eden. However, it was a woman named Miriam that brought that light back in, who was a virgin. And she brought the light not only of the world, but the light of the whole universe into being in a little town called Bethlehem. You see, that's the Hebrew for what you know as Bethlehem. Bethlehem in Hebrew means house of bread. Isn't that interesting that Jesus, the bread of life, when he was born, was born in the city of bread, the house of bread. 
And so it was the woman that put the light out in the world. It's the woman who now has brought the light back into the world. Notice when she brought the light to herself, she passed it three times. The Jewish people who don't know Yeshua can't tell you why they do that. Three is a predominant number in this table that is set every Friday night in every Jewish home that is practicing the faith of Judaism. Three speaks to me of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. On this table, there is a piece of bread that is known as challah. The two pieces of bread are chalot. Now many homes only have one piece of bread. It must weigh two pounds, two being the number of the, number of the double portion. If you have the one pound size, you have to have two loaves. On top of that, there's poppy seed, and it crunches as you eat. We're reminded of the double portion of manna that was given to us so that we didn't have to gather and work on the Shabbat. And as we eat it, we remember that it was in the desert because it's crunchy like sand. Notice that it's woven. Each one of those pieces of, of, of dough are woven together. This is one that has five pieces of dough woven together. Interesting. Three, God, Father, God, Son, God, Holy Spirit. Two, being unity in the family that's brought together on Shabbat. We even have a candle that is woven, and we'll cover that later on tonight. But this happens in every Jewish home. Why? Because every Jew knows and remembers that bread was always the establishing of a covenant. Bread and wine. Now, if I say wine tonight, I'm going to use the word wine, but it could be the fruit of the vine. We won't argue over this issue, whether it was wine or whether it was grape juice. I'm not going to argue over that issue. If I just say wine, please don't mean that it's wine necessarily. Amen? Okay, let's not get into confusion tonight. I want you to go, to begin with, to Leviticus chapter 24. Now tonight may be a little bit of a lengthy service, but last night, and I think every night, they've had to close the lights on us anyway to get us out of here. So why should any night be any different? Tonight's a very special night because all of the things that we have been through this week are all going to come together tonight as we unify and become one in the body of Messiah, Jesus. Now in Leviticus chapter 24, in verse 5, the bread that you saw a few moments ago is spoken of, and thou shalt take fine flour and bake twelve cakes thereof, two tenth deals, shall be one cake. And thou shalt set them in two rows, six on a row, upon the pure table before the Lord. And thou shalt put pure frankincense upon each row, that it may be on the bread for a memorial, even an offering made by what? Fire unto the Lord. So they took that frankincense, it was not powdered frankincense and put upon the bread, but it was frankincense in little vessels and they would take that frankincense over and begin to burn pure frankincense upon the golden altar. Now it says in verse 8 how often this occurred. Every Sabbath he shall set it in order before the Lord continually, being taken from the children of Israel by an everlasting covenant, and it shall be Aaron's and his sons. It was not all the priests, but Aaron's and his sons. Aaron is a type of Jesus. The sons speak of the believers. How many believers do we have in here? Okay, you're Aaron's sons. And it shall be Aaron's and his sons, and they shall eat it in the holy place. Where did it occur? In the holy place, as we saw a few moments ago. For it is most holy unto him of the offerings of the Lord made by fire by a perpetual statute. Now, Let's go to the New Testament because something interesting happens, and I hope that somehow we can get back to this church to do a Passover feast for you. Because I believe you, you would be blessed beyond anything you can imagine. Because in that Passover, Jesus is spoken of over and over and over again. And yet my own people, the nation of Israel, miss him. But God has set the pattern up so when the eyes are open of the nation of Israel, they can see exactly what we've been doing for years. In Luke chapter 22, in verse 15, the setting here is this is the last Passover that Jesus would celebrate with his disciples. Now I want you to look in verse 15, chapter 22 of Luke, and it says, and he said, speaking of Jesus, he said unto them, 
with desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer now if you read that in the Greek there's tremendous excitement Jesus just didn't desire to celebrate this Passover with his people Jesus desired with a desire to celebrate this Passover why Jesus was excited because he was establishing something that would go on until he hands us that cup in the heavenlies he knew that that was something he was giving to the church that it would be a sign of the remembrance of his death now let me say this that the church has not emerged or should not have emerged through spiritual evolution it should be the same yesterday today and forever and what was established on the day of Pentecost I believe was the completeness of the church and instead it seems like we have gone through a metamorphosis or a, 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 a be kind we have gone through a spiritual evolution not for the good but for the worst what I mean is that many of the customs have been changed many of the things that the scripture said the early church was doing we're not doing it and so what the church what's happened to the church has kind of evolved into something that seems to not have a lot of power now you may differ with me but I don't see the book of Acts today I see a little spring of glory flowing over here and a few sparks of God's glory here and a little revival over there and and listen what we're getting ready to see is the return to the book of Acts I believe that with all my heart but God cannot bless what is not according to his pattern if we get back to God's pattern we will return to the area of the fullness of the glory of God manifest on this earth and I believe that's about ready to happen that's why God is preparing you as a Joshua generation to rise to the occasion as a kingdom of priest you go back and study this and you will find out that this is not just a desire of Jesus but it's an overwhelming compassion or exuberance to say listen I want to celebrate this Passover do you realize that Jesus knew what this meant that only a short period of time that he would be nailed to a piece of wood and Jesus that was not unfamiliar to Jesus because all during this time period it, of course we don't have it recorded in history I mean in the scriptures but we know by history that the Romans were continually crucifying people everywhere and I'm sure because of Jesus living in Jerusalem that many times he passed one of these crosses and seeing the agony of that person on that cross realizing that he himself would have to suffer that someday but he was still excited with an excitement I have desired with desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer now let's go back to the book of Revelation Revelation chapter 2 this may seem strange to you but I ask you to take on the mentality of the Bereans and search the scriptures to see if the things that Dick Rubin says are true in chapter 2 verse 1 and unto the angel of the church of Ephesus now notice that this message is not directed to the unbelievers it's not directed to the ungodly the worldly but it's directed to the believers now there were a lot of good things that Jesus had to say about the church at Ephesus but in verse 4 Jesus says nevertheless I have somewhat against thee because thou has left thy first love that's an interesting point about the church and the first love because Jesus is saying you have left your first love now if I were asked for people to raise their hands tonight many of us would probably say well it's referring to Jesus that that church had left Jesus no no that word first love in chapter 4 the last two words those two words in the Greek are protos agape 
Protos agape. Protos means above all in supremacy. The word there for love is agape, but it's translated love feast. So whatever is happening to that church, it concerns something referred to as the love feast. And the love feast was something that the early church, you can look at any Bible dictionary, look under Eucharist and you will find that it lists the reference of the love feast. And that it occurred probably every day, but at least once a week in the early church. Now the love feast was communion. Now in verse 5, remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works. Now that word works and first has to do with the first act. What was the first act that Jesus established with the church? The first act that Jesus established for the church was the fact that he handed a cup and bread to 12 Jewish men and that established the Lord's table. How many know that? That's the first act that was established with the church. And it was ratified the next day in the blood of his own being, his self, when he was crucified. So it says, remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works or else I will come unto thee quickly and re will remove thy candlestick. That word should not be candlestick but lampstand because there were no candles in the time of Jesus. There were only lamps of oil. Now, if you take to heart what is being said here, that the church in Ephesus had many wonderful things that they were doing. However, they had left that first protos agape, love feast, and the consequence of it was that the lampstand would be removed out of their presence. The lamp itself was oil. Oil speaks of the Holy Spirit. If you remove the lamp stand, you remove the anointing out of the presence of the congregation. So the book of Revelation concerning that first church, the church at Ephesus, seems to indicate to us something about a love feast and it's dealing with communion. Go back and research that. I encourage you to do that. Paul says to the church at Corinth, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and verse 7, he says, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as you are unleavened, for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Now, Paul is drawing an analogy between the Passover and Jesus, and he equates it with a feast, which probably talks about the Passover feast as well as something referred to as the agape love feast of the early church. Go back and research it. It's very easy to research this. Now, let's stop there for just a moment and let's go back to the issue of the covenant meal that is set on the table of every practicing Jew today. Let's go back to the Old Testament and look for the first incident that occurs where bread and wine is brought together as a covenant meal. Genesis chapter 14. We have the incident we talked about, the order of Melchizedek or Melchizedek earlier in the week. And here we see that Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine and he and Abram were going to have a covenant meal together. This is the first mentioning of bread and wine that we find in the scriptures. And it concerns a covenant that was about to be cut with Abram. And his name, of course, being changed to Abraham. 
Now, as we have discovered earlier in the week, for some of you that were here, we know that there were two major sacrifices every day. We find them recorded in Exodus chapter 29. Exodus chapter 29. Speaking of those sacrifices, now this is that which thou shalt offer upon the altar, two lambs of the first year, day by day continually, the one lamb thou shalt offer in the morning, and the other lamb thou shalt offer at evening. And with the one lamb, a tenth deal of flour, mingled with a fourth part of a hint of beaten oil. That speaks of unleavened bread. And also, to be offered with those sacrifices, a fourth part of a hint of wine for a drink offering. It was an impossibility to function as a priest in the Old Testament without bread and wine associated with a lamb. Jesus is referred to as the Lamb of God, isn't he? Okay. We're setting some patterns here, so don't miss what we're doing here. It was an impossibility to serve as a priest in the Old Testament unless you had bread and wine with that lamb. Now let's go back, or a few pages here, back to Exodus chapter 25. Who has an NIV in here tonight? Okay, I want you to stay with me if you will, whoever has one, because I want you to give us the interpretation of a word. Exodus chapter 25 and verse 30. And thou shalt set upon the table shewbread before me always. Now that word shoe, it occurs in the King James as shewbread, but in the NIV, the true interpretation of the Hebrew is rendered more closely. Who has it? NIV. Read it, someone. It does say the bread of presence, doesn't it? The bread of presence. So when the priest would come to this table, and for you scholars, I'll give you the interpretation. The word showbread here really means the bread of presence. It comes from the Hebrew word pane, which means the face. But the root word of that Hebrew is pana, which means to face, the appearance or the presence of God. So when the priest came to that table of showbread and they ate of that bread, they were experiencing the presence of God. Right? You had it in your Bible. Now, it was taken by the priest how often? We discovered that was the first scripture. How often was it? Every Sabbath, wasn't it? Once a week. Now, we have a bread that's taken by the nation of Israel once a year at Passover. We'll be taking of this tonight. It looks more like a cracker because there is no leaven to cause it to rise. It's very thin. This piece of matzah, as it's called, notice the stripes on the matzah. If you can see it, you will see that there are holes and areas of piercing on that bread. Now, who had no leaven in it? Who was striped and who was pierced? We'll talk about that in a few moments. I wish we'd have had time this week to go through a little bit of Passover, but I'm telling you, I, I'm like Jesus. I'm excited to come back and do a Passover. I don't know where we're going to put everybody, but praise God, we'll put you all somewhere. So the nation of Israel took this bread once a year. The priest had the bread once every week. And the early church could have possibly had it every day. Now, when I say possibly, listen, I'm not trying to fool you. I'll be kind to you. If people weren't kind to me. I had to hear from the Holy Ghost to figure a lot of this stuff out because he showed me the word. But where there's a controversy, I want to let you know so that you don't become confused. If you go back now to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 2. <clears throat> Speaking of the early church, it says, verse 46, and they continuing daily, well, I'll tell you what, let's go back to Acts chapter 2, verse 42, first of all. Speaking of those 3,000 folks that got full of the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost, plus I believe the rest of those who call themselves believers, Jesus. 
In verse 42, it says, And they, speaking of that 3,000 plus the others, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Now, the apostle doctrine speaks of the Word of God. Now, they didn't have a Bible like you have, but the apostles were getting revelation of the Holy Ghost so that you could have the Bible put into your hand. It was in the process of being written at that time. So they didn't have the privilege of coming together to have Bible study. They came together to have apostle study. <laughs> but it's the same thing today. This is a picture of the early church. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. Now that word fellowship is kononia. Say kononia. Don't forget that. We're going to see that in just a moment. Reveal. Now they continued. They studied the apostles' doctrine. And in breaking of bread, and that speaks of communion or the agape love feast, and in prayers. There were three things the early church got together to do, to study the word of God. They got together to pray together, and they got together to have communion. Isn't that interesting that in the overhead, we saw three pieces of furniture that were in the area that was 2,000 cubits, representative of the church. What were they? Lampstand. What is the lampstand representative of? The word of God. For David says, thy word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. So the lampstand is equal to the word of God. That's equal to what they were doing in the early church because they were in the holy place. They were in the church age. And the holy place reveals the church age. Now they prayed together, and please don't miss this one. What piece of furniture is equated to prayer and praise and worship? The golden altar. That's in the holy place. And what else did they did? What else did they do? They broke bread. They had communion. That's the table of showbread. So the three pieces of furniture that you see in the holy place of the Old Testament is representative of the church today. We should be praying together, studying God's word together, and breaking the Lord's table together. You see, what fits in the old, the pattern of the old, is revealed in the new. Now, possibly, let's go over now to Acts chapter 2, verse 46 this time. Now, notice I'm saying possibly because there is a controversial issue between theologians as to whether this means what you think it says or not. And they, speaking of that church, continuing daily with one accord in one, uh, in one accord in the temple. Now, notice the comma. Now, the early translators had to put these commas and punctuation marks in the scripture because they did not exist in the original Greek. But there was something that the early translators of the manuscripts and early writings of the church seemed to indicate there needed to be a break here. And that's exactly what a comma does. It breaks a thought into another thought. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple, comma, one thought. Breaking bread from house to house, comma. They did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, comma. Now it says they did this on a daily basis. They went to the temple. They broke bread from house to house, and they did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. Many theologians believe that that breaking of bread speaks about the physical meal that they ate. So I'll let that kind of be a, a kind of an iffy thing. No one seems to know but we're going to define here in just a moment the frequency of the early church and communion. So I just wanted you to look at that and see that there is a problem there among some scholars and theologians as to whether it was daily or not. Now the priesthood was an impossible task without what? The offering, and the offerings had to have with the lamb in the morning, lamb in the evening, they had to have what? Bread and wine associated with that. So it was an impossibility in the Old Testament to be a priest unless you had that bread and wine at the offerings. Now the offerings were once a day. However, the priest gathered at the table of showbread once a week. So bread and wine was associated daily with the offerings, but the priest got together at the table of showbread at least once a week, every week. Now, what is the table or what is the showbread called as we read a few moments ago in Exodus chapter 25, verse 30? It's called the bread of presence. Say bread of presence. Now, we're just laying some groundwork so that all these pieces can be tied together. Now, I want you to go to the book of Joel for just a moment. 
the book of Joel, and you will see that the priest had become very slothful in their task of priesthood. And we see in Joel chapter 1, go back and study it, and you'll see that really what it's talking about here. You have to go back and lay a little groundwork, but I don't have time to get into that, but you read this verse 9. Now the meat offering and the drink offering is cut off from the house of the Lord. What associated the meat offering? What associated that burnt offering? Bread, wasn't it? The bread and the drink offering. Are you with me? Joel chapter 1, verse 9. Now the meat offering, which is also referred to as the meal offering, the meat offering or the bread or meal offering and the drink offering is cut off from the house of the Lord. The priest, the Lord's ministers, mourn. Verse 13. Gird yourselves and lament, you priest. Howl, you ministers of the altar. Come and lie all night in sackcloth, you ministers of my God. For the meat offering and the drink offering is withholden from the house of your God. From the presence of the priest, God, because of their slothfulness, removed the bread and the wine. I think we've got a lot of slothful priests today. And the enemy's been permitted to come in and steal part of your inheritance as a believer. 69 times God mentions in his word bread and wine associated with offerings. And here we see in Joel that the slothfulness concerning God in the Old Testament caused the bread and wine to be taken. If you remove the bread and wine, what do you remove? The bread of presence, you got it. The bread of presence. Some say concerning communion, you're going to make a ritual out of it. I've never once ever seen anybody complain about passing the offering and making that a ritual. We do it every time we get together. Come on, let's be honest. And probably you've never heard anyone really chastise you for reading the Word of God every day. Might make a ritual out of that one if you do it every day. I've never heard anyone chastise a believer for praying every day. Watch out. You might make a ritual out of that one. But boy, when it comes to the Lord's table, if we do it the third Sunday of the month, man, we're doing God a favor. I'm telling you what, you're doing yourself a disfavor if you understand what the table is all about. You see, it's nonsense to believe we would read the Word of God every day and make it a ritual. We need the Word of God every day. It's nonsense to believe that you can pray every day and make a ritual of that. We need prayer and communion with God. But boy, when it comes time for the communion, hey, you're going to make a ritual out of that. Please stay away from it. Woo! They've made the table of the Lord a snare and a trap. We're going to see that all develop here in a minute. Now we know that there was a possibility, a very good possibility. However, I notice I'm stressing possibility that the early church did it every day. But I'm going to show you how often the church did it for sure. Let's go to the book of Acts chapter 20. The book of Acts chapter 20. We have a pattern for the early church. Meeting together. Acts chapter 20 verse 7. Says upon the first day of the week. When the disciples came together. To what? Break bread. That specifically states communion. I'll give it to these theologians and say, well, maybe it was every day, maybe it wasn't every day. But I'll tell you, the early church met every week and did it. To a Jew, the bread and wine is a covenant remembrance. To me as a Jew, because there are five braids of that dough, I remember God's grace on this day. And we spend the whole day with God. And it's a shame that the church doesn't catch 
the understanding of spending a day with God. And instead, if we spend two hours on Sunday morning, we're doing God a favor by coming to his presence. No, we've missed it. I'm looking for the time that we have Sundays the whole day worshiping God instead of a couple hours. I think every congregation needs to check their watch at the door or leave it home. <laughs> Isn't it going to be neat in heaven? We don't have to have watch because, watches because there's no time in heaven. <laughs> anyway. Now, let's look at this thing about communion. The early church could have possibly done it every day, but for sure they did it once a week because it says on the first day of the week when the disciples came together, they came together to break bread. That was the focal point of the early church. That was the first work that was established with the early church. That's what Jesus says, I believe, in the revelation of John. You better get back to the first works you did, the first act, the first deed. You've left that agape love feast. You've left my table. We're going to see how that figures out in the rest of the book of Revelation in a moment. And if we do it two times a year, it becomes a ritual. We've missed it, folks. We've missed it. You try to read your word once every third Sunday of the month and see how long you live spiritually. You try to pray once every third Sunday of the month. See how long you have a relationship and a communion with Jesus. We've missed this thing about the Lord's table. The devil has stolen from our church the full revelation of Jesus and his provisions because we're going to see it begin to develop in the Lord's table now. Remember I said Acts chapter 2 verse 42 had a word that's called fellowship. And I gave you the Greek for that word fellowship. Anybody remember? It was what? Konania. Say it again so you don't remember. I mean, so you don't forget it. Say konania. Now, what is konania? Koinonia is the Greek word for the word communion. I want you to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 16. Let me say this. There may be some of you here tonight that are skeptical of what is being taught. I ask you to examine the word for yourself, and by the end of tonight's message, whatever your feelings are, God bless you. It doesn't make a difference to me. It makes a difference to me if I give you the word, then the Holy Spirit has to give you the truth of that word. Amen? So don't judge this until you get finished. Now it says in verse 16, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? That's speaking, how many know that's speaking of the Lord's table? That word communion is the, again that word konania. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 now. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, turn back a few pages. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 9. God is faithful by whom you were called unto the what? Fellowship of who? His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. That word again. You were called as a believer to fellowship. You were called to konania. Now let me tell you what konania is in the Greek. Konania in the Greek is social intercourse. We know that God gave the act of marriage between a husband and wife as that thing that builds intimacy in a marriage. You know what I'm talking about? We're adults. That with, in fact, unless the consummation of the marriage occurs, you don't really have a marriage. A marriage is not consisting of the vows that a preacher says the marriage consists of the consummation of a marriage. Are you with me? That's where intimacy is built. It's a God-given gift to men and to women. The enemy's perverted, but it's a God-given gift. So really, when we're thinking of communion, the reality of that statement is we're making love with Jesus. Intimacy is being built at the Lord's table. How would you, as a husband or a wife, enjoy 
that relationship third Sunday of every month. I'm being honest, but I'm trying to give you a point. You wouldn't have much of a marriage, would you? No. Now, I want you to hold that in your mind, what we're talking about, because I want to establish something with you now. If you go back now to Matthew chapter 7, Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, it says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have we not cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. Verse 23, and then, G and then Jesus says, Then will I profess unto them, I never what? Knew you. If you go back and study the virgins, the five virgins were on the outside of the door trying to get into the kingdom of God, and he says, I don't know you. Now, I want you to go back to Matthew chapter 1, and you will find that the Bible interprets the Bible, because where it says, Jesus said, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. Notice in verse 24, you will find the interpretation of what that new is, because it's the same Greek word. Matthew chapter 1, verse 24, And then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, speaking of the Virgin Mary, verse 25, speaking of Joseph, and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. When it says that Joseph never knew Mary, that's talking about the intimate relationship between a husband and wife. Joseph and Mary never had that relationship until Jesus was born. We know what that's talking about, don't we? What do you think Jesus is referring to when he says, Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. I never had that intimate relationship with me. Oh, yes, you were prophesying. Oh, yes, you were casting out devils. But there was no intimacy there. I don't know who you are. The virgins were on the outside of the door saying, Let me in. Let, let us in, Lord. We have prophesied. We've done many wonderful works. He says, I don't know you. I never had that intimacy with you. Where does intimacy come from? That Kononia, that fellowship with Jesus. Let me tell you, we've missed this thing about the Lord's table. Without communion, we're blind, not really knowing Jesus. I want to prove that point. Let's go to Luke chapter 24. Jesus had just been freshly resurrected. However, the word hadn't gotten to this pitiful town named Emmaus. Emmaus is the pits. If you ever have a tour to Emmaus, unless they give it to you free of charge, don't go. No one wants to go to Emmaus. Now, there were two disciples on the road to Emmaus. It says in Luke chapter 24, verse 13, And behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem, about seven or eight miles, three score furlongs, whatever. Now, if you go back and take it within the context, it says evidently they were discussing what had happened. These disciples had maybe possibly been with Jesus for the entire length of his ministry. However, they had seen the Romans nail him to a cross. They had seen him die, and they saw him put into the tomb as any other mortal being would have been put into the tomb. But they didn't realize they were putting Jesus in the tomb, and he would not decay, that he would rise again three days later. But they didn't know that. So as they were walking on this road to Emmaus, it says that someone drew near to them. Let's look at it. In verse 14, and when they talked together of all the things that had happened, and it came to pass that while they communed together in reason, Jesus himself drew near, and they went with him. But their eyes were holden that they should not know him. Here they were meeting the resurrected Christ, the one whom they believed to be the Messiah, they didn't even recognize who they were with. Now evidently they had spent a long period of time on the road. We're not sure as to when this happened. It could have happened early in the morning. 
But as they got to Emmaus, they said, listen, man, you've been with us all afternoon. We really appreciate your company. Why don't you come on and stay with us for a while? And Jesus had spent most of the afternoon telling them all about the things the prophets had said about this one who would be the Messiah. Verse 25 now. Then he said to them, O fools and slow of heart to believe all the prophets have spoken, ought not to, uh, Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. And they drew nigh into the village, whether they went, and he met as though he would have gone further. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in with them. They'd been all day with Jesus, telling him of all their problems, and Jesus was trying to tell them, Listen, you know these things should have happened. Moses spoke about it. The prophet spoke about it. But they still didn't know who he was, who he was or who they were with. Verse 30, And it came to pass as he sat at meat with them, that he took bread. He probably took a piece of bread much like you see here. And Jesus took that bread. And his disciples still didn't know who he was. And he said the same Hebrew prayer that he always said over the bread. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam hamotzi lechemim haaretz. Blessed art thou, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who brings forth the bread from the earth. He broke the bread. The scripture says their eyes were opened and they saw Jesus and he vanished out of their sight. How did they see Jesus? At the breaking of the bread. The full revelation of who he was. Several years ago, we had the privilege of God had revealed to me over a period of about two years the revelation of what I'm sharing with you tonight. And we had made a two-tape album on communion and what it meant. A man was sent into our life. And this man distributed these tapes as fast as we produced them. But we were poor evangelists. We didn't have all of the wonderful ability to have... 10 duplications of one tape. We had to do them one at a time, one at a time. But this man, and I don't know how he did it to this day, he distributed these tapes all around the world. To me, it was a fresh revelation. I'd never heard anybody ever teach this before. But when people began to get the tapes, we began to get letters back from all over the world, even from Israel. Brother Reuben, the Lord's table has changed my life. I'm telling you miracles, things that you could not believe were happening because people were breaking the bread and they were finally seeing Jesus in the reality of who he is. And we want to do this once every third Sunday of the month. The scripture says in Hosea chapter 4 verse 6, my people perish for lack of what? Knowledge. How many of you can quote the rest of that verse? And because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will reject you as my priest. The reason I believe the presence of the Lord is not in many churches today is because the bread of presence is missing. Amos chapter 8 verse 11 said there would be a time in the last days that there would be a famine, not of the famine of the food that you eat, but of a famine for the word of God. Those who are unlearned in the scriptures have made the table of the Lord a snare. Now let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 11 for just a moment because Paul had to deal rather harshly with the church at Corinth for perverting the Lord's table. But I want to share something with you in 1 Corinthians, verse 27 and verse 29. I know myself that I've had to at times when maybe I became angry over an issue or whatever, not because of immorality, but just, just human nature sometimes. I felt, Lord, I, I don't feel right. I, I would pass the table of the Lord when it would come by me in the pews. I would just say, Lord, I better not touch that. Your word says if I touch it unworthily, I might die. 
Now let me go back and show you something in verse 27. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 27 says, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord, how? Unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Verse 29 says, For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. And we'll cover the rest of that issue, but I want to share with you those two words right there are from the Greek. And the Greek word there is an oxys, which means irreverently. Irreverently has nothing to do with your condition of sin. And if you take it within the context of what's being said here in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul was condemning the early church for taking the communion wine and getting drunk on it and condemning that church at Corinth for taking the bread and eating it as a meal. And what did Paul say? I read it earlier, and you can go back and make a note of it. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, Paul says, Purge out the leaven. How? Keeping the feast. The table of the Lord will purge you of your sins and bring to the things of the surface, that draws to the surface, so you can take care of it. The table is set for the sinners. That's the reason for the table. It is a place of purging. It's a time to intimately meet Jesus face to face and have the Holy Spirit say, listen, this is not right in your life, and begin to bring that dross up and clean us. Go back and study them. Listen, put this thing together. It may be new to you, but I'm telling you we're on to something. I might be a nut, but I'm screwed on the right bolt. And the church has missed it. The enemy has ripped it off because he knows what it does. How many know that we're to be conformed more to the image of Christ and take on more divine nature every day of our life? You can't do that if that leaven is still hanging in there and God has given us a method of purging that leaven. Let's look at this, is what Jesus says about it. Go to John, the Gospel of John chapter 6. The Gospel of John chapter 6, verse 35 will begin. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life, and he that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Jesus says he is the bread of life. Skip down now to verse 48. I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. Jesus says, verse 51, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh. And I will give for the, that, that I will, which I will give for the life of the world. Jesus is equating them to himself being the living bread and that bread being the flesh. Now I want you to notice something, verse 52. The Jews therefore strove or argued among themselves saying, how can that, this man give us his flesh to eat? They were misunderstanding what, God, what, what, what Jesus was saying. But let's go on and see what Jesus is referring to here. In verse 53 it says, And then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. You want to know why so many congregations have no life in it? Bread of presence is gone. Verse 54, again Jesus continues, Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. He's talking about communion. That intimacy is built there, that kononia. Verse 55, for my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. That's kononia, baby. As the living Father has sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. Listen, I don't know whether you understand what you're reading, but the promises that are given here are phenomenal to those who would eat the flesh and drink the blood. Amen. Now verse 63. It is the Spirit that quickeneth the flesh, profiteth nothing, 
The words that I speak unto you, what did he just speak about? His flesh and his blood. He says, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Woo, hallelujah. And that's the promise that God has given to the church because it's that kononia, the building of that intimacy between us and the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, Jesus. Now the next verse I'm going to read, I refer to as the Antichrist verse because it's John chapter 6, verse 66. Because this is where the devil rips us off. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Why? Because he was talking about his flesh and his blood. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, will you go also away? Verse 68, Simon Peter, bless his heart. He answered him and said, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me and I in him. As the living Father has sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. And I'll say this. You talk about soul food. That's soul food, brother. That's soul food. And if you will do this on a consistent basis, I'm telling you, you're going to grow out of your spiritual socks almost overnight. Now, I can't prove this in Scripture. How many know of a man named Smith, Migg Smith, Smith Wigglesworth? He is probably the greatest man of faith, even though some of his messages have been perverted. He is probably the greatest man of faith that has lived in our century. Read his biography, and you will find out that Smith Wigglesworth took communion every day. Now, there was a requirement for coming to the Passover table, remembering that the Lord's table came from the Passover table. Let's look in Exodus chapter 12, because tonight... We could be in some real trouble if we don't look at the pattern. Exodus chapter 12, verse 43. There was one requirement for coming to the Lord's table. And the Lord said unto Moses and unto Aaron, This is the ordinance of Passover. There shall no stranger eat thereof. But every man's servant that is bought for money, when thou hast circumcised him, then shall he eat thereof. Anyone in here tonight who is not circumcised, please do not take this table. Boy, look at the sweat glistening on some eyebrows tonight. Oh, I forgot to tell you this. Did you see that was a pattern? It's no longer the circumcision of the flesh that's the requirement for this table. It's the circumcision of the heart. This table is set for the believers. That's why Jesus was so excited in establishing this. It belongs to those who are not circumcised of the flesh but have their hearts circumcised by being born again. You see, the pattern for the old is the same for the pattern of the new. Now, I'm going to give you something that's going to be really hard for you to swallow. I realize this. Wear it loose, and if it doesn't fit, stick it in your back pocket. Maybe it will fit someday. I want you to go to Hebrews chapter 10. This week we have been in and out of the book of Hebrews so much. Hebrews chapter 10, whoever the writer of the book of Hebrews was, he had a tremendous insight and understanding of the configuration of the temple of the Old Testament, how everything fit together in the temple, how the priesthood functioned, whatever. Now it says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19, 
Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Verse 20. By a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his what? Flesh. Now last night we talked about the veil and how the veil was opened between the holy place and the holy of holies. But it says that there's another veil. And what does it say the veil is equated to? Come on, the flesh. When you eat of the bread, you're taking of the representation of the flesh, aren't you? Now, like I said, I want you to wear this very loose. To me, it speaks loudly and clear. But the Holy Spirit has to reveal this to you. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. That's speaking of the blood, isn't it? Hello? Okay. The latter part speaks of the flesh. And Jesus spoke of the flesh and the blood. Except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Oh, you know the promises we read a few moments ago? Go back to the Gospel of John, chapter 6. You'll see them again. However, at the beginning of verse 20, it tells us that we enter in by a new and a living way. Now, maybe you've never questioned this, but I did. I said, what does it mean by a new and a living way? Now, remember, it's equating the physical blood of Jesus and the physical flesh of Jesus here to a new and a living way. What is the new and living way? Let's go back to Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. I know by our traditions that maybe many things that are being said tonight are new to you. Let them settle out. Don't turn off the radio receiver quite yet. Luke chapter 22, verse 20. This is when Jesus had taken the bread, he broke it, he gave it to his disciples and said, this is my body which is given for you, do this in remembrance of me. Verse 20 says, likewise also the cup after supper he picked up saying, this is the cup of what? This is the cup of my New Testament. He said, this is the blood of my new covenant. So the cup is represented by the new. The cup is associated to that which is the new. Are you with me? What is the living way? By a new and a living way. The new is associated with the new covenant and the cup. Let's go back to the Gospel of John, chapter 6. It says we enter by a new and a living way through the veil, which is his flesh. Notice what Jesus refers to himself as in verse 51, the Gospel of John, chapter 51. Jesus doesn't say he's just the bread, but he says he's the what? Living bread. What is the new and the living way? The new, I believe, represents the cup. The living way is the living bread that we take. Again, we're back to the cup and the bread. And I believe that there is a veil that most Christians have never penetrated. And it's a veil that says that when we take of his flesh, we penetrate that veil. And it was always on the other side of the veil in the Holy of Holies, in the presence of God, that the blood was taken. So that's why we eat the bread first. We penetrate a veil, breaking into his glory, and there we take the cup. Do you remember what Jesus told his disciples? He said, I will never drink of this cup again until I drink it fresh and new with you in the kingdom. And do you realize that when we meet Jesus at the marriage feast of the Lamb, he's coming to each of us and say, drink, my beloved. Drink, drink, I've given it to you as the blood of my New Testament. Now I fully ratify that New Testament for you're in my glory for all eternity. Drink, I will never take of this cup again until I drink it fresh and new with you in my kingdom. Drink, 
I'm telling you, there's something we've missed entering the glory of God at the presence of the Lord at his table. And the devil has seen fit to take it away from us and pervert it and make it such a scary occasion we're afraid to even touch it. It's been made so holy that we as sinners can't touch it when it was made for the sinner, not for the holy. Wear it loose if it doesn't fit it. Don't wear it. Now let's see something else that the table of showbread is about. Let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 21. 1 Samuel chapter 21. It says in verse 1, Then came David to Nob, to Ahimelech the priest. Don't have time to get into all of it. Go back and look. But David was hungry. He wanted something to eat. In verse 4 it says, The priest answered David and said, There's no common bread under my hand, but there is hallowed bread. And there were conditions for taking that bread that the young men had to have kept themselves from immorality. In verse 6, uh, in verse six it says, So the priest gave him hallowed bread. For there was no bread there but the shoe bread that was taken before the Lord to put hot bread in the day when it was taken away. Now, you can go back and you can study this word shoe bread, and you will find that this is a different word for shoe bread because it is referred to as lechem, or food. It comes from a root word in the Hebrew, lechem, which means to battle, as to war, to fight or to war against an enemy. Bread for the battle. The table of the Lord builds strength in his soldiers. It's not only the bread of God's presence, it's the bread of strength. And so many Christians today don't know how to do battle. And there was, may I put a little parenthesis, there was a note on my car today as we left the church. Can you explain the difference between the priestly garments and the garments of war as we see in Ephesians. Well, let me tell you, the garments that you see in Ephesians, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the sword, the word of God, that's for you to do battle with. But the priestly garments are to meet God in don't have time to get into it, but I just wanted to note that tonight for whoever wrote that note to me. So not only is the, pre the bread of presence called the presence of God, the, the showbread called the bread of presence, but now the bread has become bread for war. There's an old saying, and I don't know if you've heard it, maybe some of you old military men remember it, that an army travels on its stomach. Anyone ever heard that? It's really talking about food. If you don't feed an army food, it doesn't have strength to do war. Want to know why so many Christians today don't know how to do battle with the enemy? And they're all the time calling the pastor, Pastor, you got to pray for me? We've got this thing wrong. We take authority. The authority that we lost in the Garden of Eden through the first Adam was restored by the last Adam, Jesus. In the first Adam, he was to conquer and he was actually to subdue the earth. That word subdue is conquer. Thank God in the New Testament, we aren't conquerors. We are more than conquerors. Hallelujah. But this bread gives you the strength for that war. I want you to look at Psalm 105. Psalm 105. And I want you to notice in Psalm 105 concerning that first Passover. Now remember that the Lord's table came from the Passover. And sometime hopefully we can get back and do a Passover and you'll understand it completely then. But in Psalm 105 verse 36 it says, He smote also all the firstborn of their land, the chief of all of their strength, and he brought them forth. Speaking of God bringing the nation of Israel out of the bondage of Pharaoh in Egypt. And he brought them also forth with silver and gold. And there was not one feeble person among their tribes. Every one of those Israelites that came out of Egypt, came out of Egypt whole. Where had they just been only hours before? Eating the lamb, drinking that wine. Communion, that's where it was established from the Lord's table. 
They had had the first Passover. That's where the Lord's table comes from. And as soon as they had that Passover, nobody had to carry any of them. They had been in slavery for 430 years. There were those, I guess, who were up in age, but man, they were able to walk out. No arthritis, no nothing. In fact, they had a little extra strength because they carried all the silver and gold of Pharaoh out of that city. None sick among them, none feeble, none weak among them. And I believe when we understand the Lord's table, we're going to understand what health is. God's promise to the nation of Israel and now to the believers is this. He said, no disease of Egypt shall come nigh upon you. And as other promises says, it says, no plague shall come nigh my dwelling place. We are the dwelling place of God. Sickness is not of God. Sickness is of the devil. And the table of the Lord has been set to set us free from our sicknesses. If we can take care of the trespass and we get that part taken care of, and we can understand what God is trying to say about the Lord's table, I'm telling you, we are going to be the generation of Joshua's. And that's why the enemy wanted to steal it away from the church. He wants you sick. He wants you miserable. Do you know why the enemy wants you sick? I'll tell you why. When you're sick in your body, you cannot praise and glorify God to the fullest of your ability. It's hard. When your body is racked with pain, the cancers and these kind of things in our bodies, and we can't... Listen, there's a pastor that I know, he's had about six heart attacks. They said, don't you get in that pulpit anymore, you're going to die. He said, bless God, I'm going to praise God, I'm going to preach the word with all of my heart, all of my mind, and all of my soul, and if I'm called home, I had instant death is instant glory. We get a little headache, we can't show up on Sunday morning. We have to be here another week to do that. Boy, we can stay there on a Friday night. Hey, come on team, come on team. Oh, I don't feel good this morning, Myrtle. Oh, I don't, don't feel good. See, the enemy, it might, it might be real. You see, the enemy puts a little sickness in your body, keeps you from the things of God. God says, I'll give you strength, I'll give you health, I'll give you the bread of my presence. So come to me and worship me with all of your heart, all of your mind, all of your soul, all of your very being. Hallelujah. Now, I know it's been a little long, but we ain't even got started yet, Jack. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Listen, this, this message, I believe, is so important to the body of Christ. One of the basic doctrines of the assemblies of God is the Lord's table. But if we don't understand the significance of the Lord's table, we might not do it quite as frequently as if we understood what it is. Solomon says, with all wisdom above all, get understanding with that wisdom. Now let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We're going to take some of the scare tactics, tactics away that the enemy has used. We've already done it with this word unworthy because it doesn't say anything about being unworthy in the sense that we think it's talking about. It says irreverently. If you come to this table tonight to have a little bit of grape juice, Welch's grape juice and a cracker, nothing's going to happen to you. Guarantee it. But if that's the attitude that you come to, to the Lord's table, I'll tell you what you open yourself up for. Sickness, disease. It isn't that you get sickness and, and disease for taking this irreverently because when you take it irreverently, it can do you no good. And sickness can come upon you. We've gotten this thing backwards. We've been scared out of our, our Holy Ghost socks. Say, man, I can't take that thing. Whew. Man, you know, I might get struck dead. Missed the point. That's what the enemy wants you to think. Let's go back here, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and look at this thing. Verse 29, He that eateth and drinketh unworthily, that's irreverently, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. And for this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. In other words, some have gotten sick, some are weak and feeble, some have even died. I believe there's Christians today that didn't need to die if they would have understood the Lord's table. Now it says we must discern the Lord's body. Notice the word capital, Lord's. Go back and research that. It's talking about Jesus. Now we take a piece of matzah. And when we take a piece of matzah, we take a piece of matzah that is thin. There's no leaven in it. 
Now, in the Hebrew, what we do at, a, at, at, the, at the Lord's ta uh, or at the Passover, and I'm going to give you a little clue here and hope it doesn't mess things up. Still, cheap matzah. It's supposed to break straight. Anyway, what we do in Passover, we break this piece of matzah, which is the center portion of matzah. We have three pieces of matzah, one on top of the other. We pull the center piece out. We break it, wrap it in a linen napkin. I'm not going to give you too much detail here. We hide it away until after the service. After the service, we bring out what we call the afikomen. Say afikomen. In the Greek, afikomen means I came. It means I came. Every Jew who celebrates Passover, then when he takes the afikomen, which he refers to the dessert, but in the Hebrew, I mean in the Greek, it says I came. I'm going to ask you, who came that had no leaven in him? Who came and was striped for your healing? Come on. Who came and was wounded for your transgressions, pierced with nails? Jesus. This can't speak of anything but Jesus. Isn't that interesting? They take the center part of the matzah out. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Don't take the top piece. Don't take the bottom piece. Take the center piece out. We're taking Jesus out and we don't even realize it. And a lot of Orthodox Jewish people and Hasidic Jewish people will actually take a piece of the afikoman. What's afikoman? I... I came. Come on, say afikoman means I came. They take a piece of that and hide it away in their dresser. And do you know when they get sick? They run for their dresser. You know, a Jew doesn't want to spend any money on doctor. <laughs> they run and get that piece of bread that was there at the Passover, the afikoman. I came, pierced, striped. And they break off a piece of that matzah. And they say, Elohim, Avraham, Yishkak, and Yaakov. God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'm taking this, Lord God, in the name that it represents, and I claim my healing. They take it, and they're healed. They're calling on Jesus and don't even realize it. I tell you, when I come back here, I'm going to do a Passover. It's going to blow your mind. Sometime during the year, they have a problem with their money. You know, all of us Jews are rich with this one. <laughs> you know that... Don't believe that. Don't believe it. I'm rich. I said, don't believe it. All Jews are rich. They run for their hiding place again when they have a need for a financial blessing. Lord, we're a little tight. We need a little money. God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, I take this in the name that it represents. And all of a sudden, their financial situations are healed. Who are they taking? Jesus. So it says, for he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, or un unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation unto himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Now the word there, Lord's, is the Greek word koreos, which means supreme in authority. It's talking about Jesus. He's the one that's supreme in authority. When it talks about the body there, it is the Greek word soma, which mean bo means body as a sound whole. But it comes from a root word, sode, which means deliver, protect, heal, to make whole. Why are people weak and sick among them and some have even died? Because they haven't understood what the body of the Lord has done. It says divide thoroughly. That's exactly what it's saying when it says not discerning. Not dividing thoroughly the difference between the bread and the cup. The body of the Lord did not forgive your sins. The body of Jesus bore your sins. The blood of Jesus Christ does not heal you from your diseases because the body, by his stripes, we are healed. His blood was not pierced and wounded for your transgressions. His body was pierced and wounded for your transgressions. It is the blood that has the power to eradicate and remove our sins. You see, there's a difference between the body and the flesh. And we come into the presence of the Lord every third Sunday. Thank you, Jesus. And we spend about five minutes. We take the cup. We take the cracker. We hit the door. It doesn't do us any good. We don't know anything about what we're doing. So subsequently, disease and sickness can come upon our body because we haven't even taken the time to discern what's happening. I know as a Jew the prayer, and we're going to be doing this tonight. You better look it up because I don't know what I did with my, 
overheads. They must be back in the office. I've got to have those overheads. So I'm going to teach you the Hebrew prayer. Please, honey. Uh, shows you the old Jew is losing his mind. See, it's not Alzheimer's. Don't worry. It's old timer's disease. <laughs> now, Jesus wants to fellowship with his people. We started out tonight, Revelation chapter 1, saying that Jesus, uh, Revelation chapter 2, I'm sorry, concerning the church at Ephesus, Jesus had somewhat against that church because they had left their first love. Protos Agape, a love feast. Now that's the first church mentioned. I want to go to the last church that is mentioned. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 14. Again, I want to reiterate the fact that this word, as well as the word that went to the church at Ephesus, was a word for the church. It was a word for the believers. It was not a word for the unsaved. Can you say amen? That's what the word is going to. Revelation chapter 3, verse 14, And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans. Now we have all seen the picture of Jesus knocking on the outside of a door, and there's no doorknob on the picture. How many have ever seen that? Okay. And what they equate this picture with then is the fact in verse 20 it says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come unto him and I will sup with him and he with me. Now let me ask you, self, or let me ask you something. If you keep it within the context of who the message is going to, the message is not going to the unbelievers. It's not going to the unsaved. It's going to the saved. How many can say amen? That's what it says. So if you take it within the context, verse 20 is not talking about salvation. Go back and read it again. Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him, and I will sup with him, and he with me. That word sup in the... Greek is the eating of a meal. The word sup concerns a meal. Remember, Jesus is the bread, and he's the fruit of the vine, isn't he? Now, I want you to hold your hand right there, and I want you to make a comparison for me for just a moment, or with me for just a moment. Verse 20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if any man hear my voice and open the door, who's he referring to? Go back up into verse 14. You'll see that this message is to the believer, not the unbeliever. And he says, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. That's Konania Fellowship. Hold your hand right there. Go back to the Gospel of John once again, and I want you to see one of the promises concerning communion. Verse 56, John chapter 6, verse 56. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me and I in him. I will come into him and I will sup with him and he with me. Same thing, he in me and I in him. Now in Matthew chapter 15, we're about finished. I'd appreciate if those would, who are going to minister in song and praise and worship would find your places. Because tonight, we're going to have fellowship with Jesus. And if you're not sitting with your wife tonight, I want you to get with your wife because you're going to minister communion to her tonight. For you that are here that have come by yourself, I don't want anyone tonight to have communion by yourself. You're going to break bread with someone. Matthew chapter 15, verse 22. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with a devil. Speaking of Jesus, but he answered her not a word, and his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. Verse 24, But he answered and said, I am not sent, but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then came she and worshipped him, or fell at his feet, saying, Lord, help me. What was her desire? To have her daughter set free from the enemy's oppression. 
Verse 26, Jesus says about that deliverance, he says, it's not meat to take the children's bread and cast it to the dogs. The children's bread that he's talking about casting to the dogs is deliverance, and he's equating it to the bread. Having a little bit of demon activity in your life? Have a little koinonia with Jesus, and it'll leave. The table of the Lord will set you free. If you have a sickness in your body, the table of the Lord will touch your body and heal it. Have a little problem seeing Jesus clearly? Konania will bring him closer. And I believe this. If we look at the body of Christ, the enemy is reaping havoc in our families. Now, I can't prove this by Scripture. You're going to have to let the Spirit talk to you about it. But Jesus says when the Holy Ghost comes that you'll be witnesses first in Jerusalem, then Judea, then Samaria, and then the uttermost parts of the world. Today, your home life, the Jerusalem, if it isn't straight, when you come into the congregational setting, nothing else will go right for you. Oh, you'll praise God, you'll jump and holler and shout. But too many homes today, the Jerusalems are out of order because the husband is not taking his rightful place in the family. I've seen this happen in families that they have an altar in their home, not a physical altar, but a time to be with Jesus. And that the husband takes down the cup and fills it with the fruit of the vine and takes the bread and breaks the bread and feeds his wife and his family, getting his Jerusalem in order. There's not one scripture that says that the deacon and elder has to hand this thing out. It's for the priest, folks. It's for the priesthood. And if your Jerusalem is straight, when you come into your Judea here, and God sends you out into Samaria and the uttermost parts of the world, you'll be in God's order. And I believe that every home needs to have communion in it. And watch how Jesus becomes so brilliant and bright in that family. Don't expect to come to church to get your family together. Get your family together out in Jerusalem and come over here into Judea and watch what God does in the midst of his people. But no, we're always looking for the pastor to do all the miracles. Pastor, my home life is in wrecks. It's in bad shape. When I was a pastor, I used to say, go buy some Welch's grape juice, get some crackers, have communion with your family, because when you do, Jesus is established in the presence of that home. It may sound different to you. I told somebody not long ago, I'm an experimenter in God. Try it. God says, try me. Test me. I'll pay for anybody's funeral that has communion and drops over dead because they take it in their home. You better be at the communion table. You better not be anywhere else. I'm not going to pay for it. We haven't understood what the Lord's table is for. It's for us as believers, and we have let the devil chase us away from it. We've let men scare us long enough away from the Lord's table. Even in our own family, when some of the young children would get sick, didn't call on the doctor, gave him communion. The grandchildren were healed of fevers. I can 
tell you things over and over and over again that happened. Oh, you shouldn't give a little child communion? Really? Many times a little child understands God far greater than we do. All I can say is try it. As the leadership comes to begin to distribute the elements of communion, we've done something that maybe most Jews you wouldn't think do. We've given you some big pieces tonight of the matzah. Because I want you to, as these elements are passed out tonight, I want you to hold on to the bread, don't eat the bread. Hold on to the cup, don't drink the cup until we all do it together. But I want you to take time to look at that bread. And if you're sick in your body tonight, I want you to look at the stripes that are in that piece of matzah. Say, Lord, I expect to be healed tonight. As you look at that piercing, I want you to the holes in the bread. I want you to contemplate the fact that he was wounded for your transgressions. You can begin to pass it out. We're going to have to move very quickly tonight. A lot of us are here. Let this be a time that you meet the Lord. You can examine yourself to be sure that you're taking this because you want the presence of the Lord. You want the bread of presence. If you're taking it because you're hungry, don't take it because you're hungry. And if you're here tonight and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, I don't want you to take this table, but I want you now to stand to your feet. Anyone here that needs Jesus, because I'm going to bring you into the kingdom by the power of the Holy Ghost. God is going to bring you into that presence, and you will be circumcised, ready to take of the Lord's table. Anyone here tonight need Jesus? I'm not going to have every head bowed. If you don't want Je every head bowed and every eye is closed, I'm not, if you don't want Jesus, you don't want Jesus. If you, don't, if you need Jesus tonight, do it in front of everyone. There's nothing to be ashamed of. Jesus loves you. As the singers begin to sing some praises, and the elements are passed out, hold on to them. As we're going to meet Jesus in Konania Fellowship tonight. him because he first loved us and yet he said because we've left our first love the remembrance of who he is and he said I'll come and I'll remove the lampstand from your midst most of the church doesn't even know the blessing that Jesus said over the bread and yet we've said it for 3,500 years Tonight we're going to teach it to you. And we're going to recognize that by the stripes in his own body, we're healed. He was wounded for our transgressions. He bore our sins in his own body on that tree at Calvary. So let's stand. Once again, I'll ask, is there anyone here that needs the circumcision of your heart tonight completed? In other words, to receive Jesus. 
as your Lord. This table is set for those who are believers, who love Jesus. Anyone tonight that needs to be born again so you can come to this table. I want you to hold your, maybe you could lower the house lights for just a few moments. The Hebrew is in what we refer to as transliteration. And I'll repeat it so that you'll be able to repeat it. It goes, Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam hamotzi lechemim haaretz. Praised are you, Adonai, our God, ruler of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. And on that night that Jesus was so excited about that he established something for us as believers, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, let's everyone try it. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Hamotzi Lechemim HaAretz. Everyone in the English Praised are you, Adonai, our God, ruler of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. Father, we thank you, Lord God, that that heavenly manna left your presence of glory. And Lord, you sent that manna to us through a little town in Israel called Bethlehem, the house of bread, born of a virgin, born for the purpose of redeeming man back to you father that's the reason that your son came being made a little lower than the angels for the purpose of suffering death so that we might have life and have it more abundantly except you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood you have no life in you jesus said that he who eats the flesh of the Son of Man and drinks his blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. He who eats the flesh of the Son of Man and drinks his blood, your promise, Lord God, is that Jesus would dwell in them, and they would dwell in Jesus. And Father, tonight, standing upon your word as the reality of all truth, Lord God, you said many are sick, some are weak, and some have even died because we have not discerned or separated thoroughly the Lord's body. Tonight, Father, we remember in the body of Jesus, by his stripes we're healed. And Father, we claim our healing tonight. Father, your word says that in his own body, Jesus bore our sins he was wounded in his body for our transgressions. He was bruised in his body for our weaknesses. Thank you, Father, that you would let your son come to this earth as that heavenly manna that we could feast upon and never hunger again. For Father, your word says, that Jesus is the living bread. Father, remembering the words again, Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam amotzilech amim haaretz. Blessed art thou, Lord our God, King of the universe, who has brought forth the bread from the earth, that heavenly man of Jesus. Tonight, Father, we do this, remembering all that the body of Jesus has provided for us as his people. Our healing, we claim it tonight. By his stripes we are healed. We claim the fact, Father, that we've cast our cares and our sins upon him, for he careth for us. And Father, as we take of this bread tonight, we do it in the name that's above all names, the Lord Jesus Christ, remembering him tonight. Husbands, I want you to minister to your wives that bread of life. Friends, minister to that person beside you, that bread of life as we take it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Jesus said, 
Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. How did he give himself? He left us the flesh and the blood. This is part of the love that you owe to your wife to minister communion to her. She's precious. She's been given to you as a gift. As Jesus took the cup, we know what cup it was that he took. In the table of Passover, there are four cups that are drunk. The first cup that we drink from is called the cup of sanctification. The second cup that we drink from is called the cup of judgment. The third cup is a cup that we have after we have eaten the meal. It's called the cup of redemption. Isn't that interesting that this is the cup that Jesus picked up and gave to his disciples? Not the cup of sanctification, not the cup of judgment, but the cup of redemption. Because it says after supper, he took this cup and he blessed it. And we know what the blessing was. And it goes like this. Baruch ata Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam borei pri hagafen. Let's try it. Baruch ata Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam borei pri hagafen. Everyone in the English now. Praised are you, Adonai, our God, ruler of the universe, creator of the fruit of the vine. Father, we thank you for the cup that we hold in our hand tonight, where it represents the shed blood of your son, Jesus Christ. How so many times, Lord God, we have talked about the blood of your son being spilled at Calvary. But Lord, to spill something is by accident. It was no accident that your son Jesus Christ was willing to give his life for us and that his blood was poured out at Calvary. We thank you, Father, for your son Jesus. We thank you for the blood that sets us free from our sins. Father, thank you that we no longer have to rely upon the blood of bulls and goats every year to only cover our sins. But Father, thank you that the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, when it's applied to our sins, washes them away, never to be remembered again. As we take of this cup tonight, remember the words, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. He who eats the flesh of the Son of Man and drinks his blood has life everlasting. He who eats the flesh of the Son of Man and drinks his blood, Jesus dwells in them, and they dwell in Jesus. Father, we've come tonight. You've knocked on the door and said you want to sup with us as your people. Jesus, we've come tonight in that Conanier relationship with you, thanking you, Father, for the provisions of the flesh of your son and his blood. And as we take of this cup tonight, remembering the words once again as Jesus had prayed over this cup, Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam amotzi lechamim haaretz. Blessed art thou, Lord our God, King of the universe, who brought forth bread from the earth. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam borei pri hagafen. Blessed art thou, Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth the fruit of the vine from the earth. Fathers, we take of this cup tonight, we proclaim the death of your son, Jesus, looking for his soon return when he will claim us as his bride. And he'll hand us that cup fresh and new and drink it with us in that kingdom that we're going to come into. Thank you, Father, for this cup. Remembering that we are betrothed to you we're no longer our own. We're bought with the price of the blood of your son, Jesus, Father. Let us not live our life for ourselves, but let us pour out our life to you, Jesus. For we're bought with the price. We're no longer our own. 
Therefore, let us glorify God in all that we do, in body and spirit. And we take this cup in the name that's above all names, the Lord Jesus Christ, proclaiming his death till he returns. Husbands, minister to your wives. Friends, minister communion one to another.